I'm actually a little surprised, and I guess, frankly, a little disappointed. Nobody took me up on that, thinking we're baptizing babies in here or something. So, anyway, but uh, we're not doing that. And is that a movie? Is that good? Or am I a little thunder or something? Yeah, we got it. Yeah, there we go. That's a good job. Okay, all right. Um, but so that's after church. We hope you'll stick around and enjoy. We're glad to have you with us this morning. And uh, uh, one of the thought also regarding the... Uh, the, uh, the uh, youth trip uh, to the, the youth camp on the 16th through the 18th. Uh, I do have permission slips here. And uh, again, as Dorn mentioned, uh, we're going to try and collect on that today and get the uh, permission slip signed. We, we need the headcount uh, just so we can get all the logistics figured out, the rest of what's left to do as far as hotel room and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we just uh, need to do that. And I'd like to try and help Julie get that wrapped up before I leave Tuesday. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, go ahead and see us afterwards. And we've got the permission slips and stuff for that. So anyway, good morning once again. Uh, if you would, open your Bibles this morning to Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. And of course, if you've been with us for even just a few weeks, you know that we're going through the book of Joshua on Sunday mornings. We've gone through the first three chapters. And of course, the theme of this book uh, becomes more and more pronounced as we make our way through it, but it has everything to do with walking by faith. Uh, the promised land, as we have mentioned numerous times along the way, is not typical of heaven, though we oftentimes are uh, kind of given the impression that it is, you know, in sort of how maybe people have talked about it or you hear it in song. But uh, as we've said, the, the promised land is not really a metaphor for heaven because uh, the promised land is filled with giants and wars and battles and fights and conquering and this kind of thing. And heaven has no such thing. When we get to heaven and we stand in the presence of God, none of those things are going to be happening anymore. It'll be simply uh, in, us in the presence of God, enjoying his presence, discovering whatever heaven is going to be uh, looking like and all about and all the exciting things about that. But there won't be fighting in any of this kind of thing. And so the promised land, rather than a metaphor for heaven, really more accurately is a metaphor for the life lived by faith. Uh, it's walking by faith, learning to trust God uh, on a day-to-day -day basis as we face, if you will, the giants in the land in our own lives, the battles that come up before us. Now, I always like to point out, or periodically at least like to point out, that um, it's important for us to understand context when we study the scriptures. It's easy to take any passage of scripture and make it say whatever you want, and that's not what we ever want to do. Uh, however, we also want to make sure that we don't miss things that God would want us to learn by way of illustration through things. Paul spoke of in Romans 15 of how God has included these things in the scriptures that were written before for our learning that we might understand them, not just with a, a sense of, okay, that's what was going on back then and that's all that is, but how did God work then? What did God do in the lives of his people then? And what can we glean from this? This is, and Joshua happens to be a very rich field for gleaning in such a way. And so uh, when I talk about uh, uh, living uh, life by faith and walking by faith, this is what God was teaching his people to do in the promised land. Now, they had been learning this for 40 years in the wilderness prior to this. However, what's the problem in that first generation in the 40 years? They did not enter because of unbelief. And so God waited, uh, as we see in, uh, is it Numbers uh, um, 15, 13 or 15, where, G where God says, uh, because the ten spies come back and they turn the hearts of the people against trusting the Lord and going into the promised land, that generation, none of it, except for Joshua and Caleb, would enter the promised land. And again, the author of Hebrews in the New Testament points out that they did not enter in because of unbelief. And there's an important thing for us to understand in a New Testament context. The promised land is not heaven. We're not talking about getting into heaven by working your way, and, and that kind of, although certainly the faith analogy comes into play at some point, but we do have to learn as Christians, those who are redeemed, those who have been delivered, again, analogy looking at Egypt and the deliverance from Egypt, uh, those who have been covered by the blood and delivered from the world, delivered from bondage and such, do have to now learn to walk by faith in the life that lies before us as we walk with the Lord. And so the book of Joshua deals literally physically with how they learned how to do that in, in, in in Joshua's time. But there's certainly things that we can glean as well as we make our way through our own Christian life. And the book of Joshua happens to be one of those places where some of those nuggets of truth and, and great insight are just laying right on the surface for us to pick up as we go. So we'll dig in, but we'll also be blessed to find many things that are, uh, when we read them, and you suddenly realize how obvious they are for us to apply. So now, Joshua chapter 3 last time uh, we summed up a lot of what chapter 3 spoke of in a very, kind of an almost simplistic sort of way, but I, 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 I tend to, to apply it this way in my own life, especially from my own experiences. But 
we saw where God had directed the people to cross the Jordan, but they were crossing behind the priests who went in first. Now, if you remember, when Moses parted the Red Sea, he stood up on the hillside, and over the course of the night, as he held his hands up over the Red Sea, in the morning, the waters parted, and they crossed over on dry land. So the water was dry from the minute they set foot into it. The Jordan was different. The Jordan was different. God did not part the waters before they walked in. In this particular case, and here's where, again, forgive me if it sounds simplistic, but it can be a memorable way to think about it. God will sometimes ask us to take steps of faith, but before we see him work, he may ask us to get our feet wet. And so in this particular case, that was a literalism. He literally had the priests, as soon as the soles of their feet touched the water, then he heaped it up on the one side and it ran down the other and, it, and they crossed on dry land. Well, that's where we pick up our story. That's where we left off last time as they have now begun to cross over the Jordan and we find ourselves here now in chapter 4. Now, chapter 4 begins by saying, And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua. Now, there's a great story that, again, the, or that the, uh, you know, the context is a little questionable, but if I've told the story before, forgive me if I tell it again for those who haven't heard it, but there was a woman who came to her pastor one day and was just heavy burdened with some kind of a trial she was going through, very, very heavy trial, and she asked the pastor to pray for her, so of course he did, and some time went by, and she came back, and she was all excited. I think it was the next Sunday she shows up, and she's all excited. Her burden has been lifted. And uh, or, or, he's, or so he thinks. She's, she's joyful now. And so he says, what happened? Are you okay? And, and she says, yeah, I just, I read a passage in the Word and it just cleared it all up for me and I'm just, that's good. It's like, well, what passage did you read? He was all excited thinking, you know, what's this wonderful insight that God gave you, you know? So she says, well, it was in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And he's thinking about it and he's thinking now, I've never heard anybody point to Luke 2, 1 for this. So he looks it up. He's like, what, what am I missing here? And Luke 2, 1 talks about how in the days of Caesar Augustus, uh, it came to pass in the days of Caesar Augustus that a, a command went forth to, uh, to, to number the people. And so he's looking at it and he's reading it. He's thinking, what on earth did God tell you from this passage? And so she says, don't you see it, pastor? It says it came to pass. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. <laughs> Now, again, the context is a little questionable, but it's a great story. And every time I come across one of those that came to pass, I can't resist. But, um, but anyway, so in Joshua's time, however, on a totally unrelated subject, when it came to pass, the people all completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua. Now, when the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, as God had said they would, okay, God has called them out of the wilderness and now they're going to enter, or they're beginning now to take those first steps, literally, of by faith as they got their feet wet, trusting God, walking across, and they stand now, uh, as they're making their way through the Jordan River, they are getting to where God has promised to bring them. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses speaks to the people. Uh, Deuteronomy, as you might recall, is the second law, second telling of the law. It's, it's the book of Exodus is where they received the law. Leviticus contains it and such. But the book of Deuteronomy, Moses recaps and goes through it again with them. It's a second telling of the law. Why? Because he's going to be departing soon. His time is coming to an end. And so he's reiterating the law to the people. And the, along the way, he makes comment about, uh, about this moment that is coming when he says that God has brought us out that he might bring us in. And I'm shortening the verse, but in essence, he speaks of how in, ver in chapter 6, verse 34, I think it is, how he led us out of Egypt that he might bring us in, ultimately, to the promised land. Now, we've said this along the way, but God, what God has promised, he is faithful and he is able to perform. When God says he's going to do something, you don't have to wonder if. You might think about when, or you might try and work out the logistics of how, but not if. If God says it, he's going to do it. And in this case, they're seeing that happen before their eyes. The, 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 the Jordan River has been parted. There's this heap of water standing there. I don't know how far down river God put his hand and stopped it, but it, they're not walking between the two walls like they did in the Red Sea. They're just walking by the one, and the other one's gone by. So this generation, by the way, has not experienced the parting of the waters. This is their first crack at this whole thing. This is their first time seeing it. And, and so God has got this wall of water standing there somewhere where I'm guessing they could probably see it. And they're probably wondering at it as they're making their way across. But they're watching God work. They're watching this amazing thing happen. They're seeing God fulfill his faithfulness and to fulfill his promises. They are learning what it means to walk by faith. 
Now, we have said this a few times along the way as well, and if you're a note taker and, and you haven't taken it yet, you're going to probably hear it a couple dozen more times before we get through this, this book. But there's something that, there's three basic things we took out of chapter one that I want to make sure that we never get too far from when it comes to living and walking in the, in the successful Christian life, if you will. And we took them from chapter one, and I'll just reiterate them real quick. We find in verses 5 through 9 where God speaks to Joshua and encourages him, tells him not to be uh, dismayed or afraid, but to be a, a strong and of good courage because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And he it commands him to, to, to meditate on the word and to take it in and to do what it says and all these things. There are lessons here that we want to always remember because we'll see elements of them always popping up throughout the book of Joshua. The first lesson again was this. God's presence is with us. Okay, His presence is with us. Now, it's not enough that we just understand that in some theoretical sense. We need to understand it and be willing to walk based on the truth of it. He is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He is always with us. And it's important that we remember that. Moses wanted to be so sure of it that when God told them to move on from one place, Moses said, don't send us unless your presence goes with us. The danger sometimes for us is that we feel like we've got it covered. Don't worry about it, God. You just stay on the throne. I got this one. No. Make sure that if he's not going, you don't go. If he's not building, you're laboring in vain. If he's not leading the way, you don't want to go in the direction he's not going. He's with us, so therefore allow him to lead you. Secondly, our trust has to remain strong in his faithfulness. As we've already said, he is faithful in that which he has promised he's able to perform. We never have to wonder about if, how, maybe, where, when, whatever. But if, no. God says it, it's as well as done. And he speaks about that often when he talks about the promised land. He talks about it often as though it were a done deal. Why? Because in his mind it is. It's done. This is what I've said. I'm going to do it. And so he's faithful. We can bank on that. And lastly, our adherence to God's word is critical. It's critical. This is why God tells Joshua specifically, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. That is to say, you will always be in it. You will be speaking from it. You will be meditating on it day and night that you may observe to do all that is written in it because then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. It is contingent. Good prosperity and good success is contingent upon living out what God has said. Okay? So he's faithful. He's always with us. And he commands us to stay in his word that we might know what he has promised, what he has said, what kinds of things that are consistent with his nature. That's essential. A lot of us tend to just sort of fly all over the place when it comes to the will of God because we don't know what God says. Therefore, we can't discriminate whether or not something is, is in accordance with his character and his nature. You know, wild left field analogy. Uh, someone comes up and says, God is telling me to divorce my wife. No, he's not. Okay, you might think he is. You might think that, you know, matter of fact, even if she's gone out and cheated on you, he's not telling you to divorce her. Reconciliation is always more important than, than divorce. It's always ought to be, a, God's desire is always to bring back together. How do I know that? Because God's word says that. Warren Wearsby once told a story about a couple that came to him saying they needed a recancellation. And he kind of talked to me, they, they were actually talking about reconciliation. And uh, so he sat and talked to them for a while and realized they kind of did need a reconciliation. They needed to kind of get back to the beginning and rebuild from the start. But that's always God's desire is to build and not to tear down. Matter of fact, we want to go one further. At one point in God's word, God actually tells one of his prophets to marry a prostitute. Okay? I mean, and that's not necessarily the one you need to bring to bear on that conversation, but it's just, you know, God is not into divorce. How, so anyway, that's a left field example. But we know these things because we know his word. We don't just go by what we feel like God is saying or what we feel like God ought to do. What is consistent with what God has said? This book of the law will not depart from your mouth, but you will meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do all that is written therein, for then you will make your way prosperous, then you have good success. Memorize that. Live it. You know, don't be hearers of the word only, but be doers. Don't be deceiving yourselves. So these three things really are, 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 are kind of foundational, not kind of, they are foundational to living the life of faith. And so Joshua here now leads the people through the Jordan River. They're, they're seeing God's faithfulness as God has commanded them to go. They're seeing that he's faithful and they're seeing the obvious hand of God with them, not only in the water that is held up, but in the fact that the priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant before them. The Ark of the Covenant, as you might recall, and we probably spoke of this last week, uh, in, I know we spoke in some detail, but if I left the detail out, I'll try and hit it now. The Ark of the Covenant was this box that sat at the center of worship in Israel. 
As a matter of fact, it was the Shekinah glory over the ark that would move throughout the wilderness in a cloud of uh, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that let them know when it was time to move. And so they became literally physically attuned to following God's lead as he would move. Uh, when, when, the, when the Shekinah would start to move, they'd pack up the tent, they'd get the whole thing wrapped up, they'd, they'd move. And where the, where the Shekinah glory settled, they'd set up everything else and it was over the Ark of the Covenant. And so the Ark of the Covenant is now moving before them. Now, it doesn't say the Shekinah glory is over it necessarily, so we don't know if that's the case, but they do know the priests and the ark are moving across. The ark symbolizes the presence of God, and he has gone out before them, and about a mile behind, they are to follow. So they don't crowd around and cloud the view of what they're supposed to be doing. God is clearly leading the way, and we are following after him as he does. So now they, as, as they're crossing, they stop in the middle of the Jordan, and all of the Israelites pass by. He's their front and rear guard, if you will. He gets them across, he leads them, and he lets them get across before eventually he will bring the waters back down. So verse 2, we continue. Uh, the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's uh, feet stood firm, uh, stood firm. And then you shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. And then Joshua called the twelve men who he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in the time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. Uh, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so, just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them uh, to the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And then Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. So the priests who bore the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord uh, had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua, and the people hurried and crossed over. Now, God here instructs his people to set up stones of remembrance, memorial stones. We've called this message stones of remembrance. He commands Joshua to tell the people, or to get one man from each of the 12 tribes to pick up a stone, bring it out out of the Jordan riverbed, and to put it in a place that he would designate. Uh, and so they do this. One member of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? Now, I don't think it's insignificant that God has someone representing each of the 12 tribes do this. It's not just that God told somebody to get a pile of stones and set it up on one side of the Jordan River and then point to it and say, when the kids ask, what's this all about? Here's what it is. He could have done that, and it could have meant the same thing. It didn't necessarily have to be 12 guys, one from each of the 12 tribes to do this. He could, have, he could have set up his own pile of stones there and done it. But he had someone from each of the 12 tribes. In essence, essentially, by extension, he had the 12 tribes participate in setting up this memorial stone, this, this pile of memorial stones. God's desire is that they personalize their experience with God's faithfulness and memorialize it. He wants them to understand that it is important to remember what God has done. Now, it's, it's easy to read stories about other people and what God has done. But when he's done something in your life personally, it becomes very meaningful to you personally. I love reading stories of, of people that God has worked in in profound ways. As a matter of fact, it was uh, some years ago when Chuck was still alive, uh, we were at a conference, and one of the, it was one of those conferences where you could see some of the younger guys were coming up, and they were getting some of the keynote uh, speaking opportunities. And it was a really neat opportunity to see, like, some of these guys and how strong they were in the Word. I mean, I'm sounding like I'm, like, looking, like I'm, I mean, they're, they're awesome. I mean, I was like, that's fantastic, you know. But they were, they were great. And one of the guys was a younger guy, probably younger than me. And I'm pretty young. 
uh, but he, uh, he made the comment that, uh, and if any of you have been around Calvary for a long time, you know some of the, you know, there, there's some of the, the, they're almost like the, 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 the stories of things that Chuck had done to set an example for people and stuff. And, and I've never been like a groupie kind of a person, but I really admired, and I loved Chuck, and I loved his ministry, and I really admired the example that he set on so many fronts. And it was, but it was, but you know, over time, people start to sort of idolize these stories and stuff. And it was just interesting and, and really cool to hear this particular guy, uh, uh, John Randall, actually, at Calvary in uh, San, uh, I think it's San Jose, California. And, uh, and he made the comment, like, you know, I, I, I know all the stories. I, I remember hearing all these things, people talking. But you know what? I want my own stories. I want God to work in my life in a way that people in our church will look at and, and, and glean from it and not memorialize what God did in my life, but see that God is still working, you know? When God works in your life personally, you're not just reading the stories. You're not just glad to be part of the team that God does stuff. But you're one of the people that God does them through or he does them to, or he does them in. That's awesome. That is life-changing. That's the kind of thing where you, you realize this is, it's not just about the manual, but it's about Emmanuel working today. It's about something that is far more than just a, a rote religion. It's a living relationship. And when you, when you know God is working in your life, it means something. Well, I think that's part of what's going on here. God is not just having a pile of stones set up there so those who actually even participated could just sort of look at. He actually goes a step further. He says, you have one of the guys from each of these tribes take a stone, like one for each tribe. Like you're, he's, he's sort of the, the, the standard bearer for the tribe, if you will, in this incident. Get, a, get one of the stones. You each bring them over. Put them in the pile there and, 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 and take part in this thing. Okay? It's, it's like he's driving it home. This happened to you. This was part of your story. This is part of what I did in your lives. Now, when generations to come see this pile of stones on the side of the Jordan and they ask, what does this mean? Notice he says, what does this mean to you? Come back to that. You tell them, this is where God dried up the river in the Jordan and delivered us into the promised land. This is where he opened the way for us to come. This is where we saw God work he part, and the kids, no doubt, when they hear these stories, they'll be like, he stopped the water? He built a wall from the river and you walked through on dry ground? Imagine your kids, if you, this happened to you and you're telling them the story. That's what he's saying. When they come and they ask you about this, well, Dad, what's this pile of rocks over here? Son, let me tell you something about our God. We came from the other side of the river and we came to this side. How do you think we got here? We took a boat. No. Guess again. You swam? No. God actually stopped the river. He, he walled up the river down there. And as far as you could see, the river left and kept on going that way, but it stopped right there. I, like, you could touch it. It stopped. And we crossed over on dry land. These rocks remind us. Why? Because we took them out of that river when it was dry while we walked across it. Think of just, wow, really? God did that? Yeah, God did that. Now, he also says... When they ask you, what, is this, what does this mean to you? That's a profound statement. What does it mean to you? This is why I say, like, watching God work in your own life and asking him to move in your life in a way that you can understand and see is vital. Because what does it mean to you that God is working? Is, am I just reading theology? Am I just reading the stories of, uh, that, that, that commentators wrote about or people yesteryear lived out and this kind of thing and say, man, it sure is cool to be part of the group of people that God is working within. That's awesome. It doesn't happen to me like that, but boy, am I glad to be part of the team. I get the t-shirt. No, it's, it's, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to you that God has saved you? What does it mean to you that God has moved you? What does it mean to you that God has done this in your life? What does it mean to you? What will you tell your children about your God? You know? Will it be a dry Sunday school lesson? Not that our Sunday schools are dry. I just realized that that came out of my mouth. It sounded wrong. But is it just a dry lesson or is it a rich experience with the, with, with the power of God in your life that you've seen it? That you've seen it. So when they ask what this is, oh, that's what God did back then. That's, no, the, this was awesome. This changed everything. Nothing has been the same since we set up that pile of rocks. Wow. Really? Yeah. As a memorial. Now, I also find it significant that it's, it's a pile of rocks. It's not a 
beautiful ornate altar. It's not a stained glass structure. It's a pile of rocks. Why? Because it doesn't take much for a memorial stone to become sort of a mausoleum for a dead faith. It doesn't take long for something that we point to that God did in the past to become an idol, a, a memento to a time long past. You know, there was a, uh, there's an incident in the book of Numbers where, um, where God strikes the people because of an act of disobedience. And, and, and they're struck with, uh, um, you know, they're struck by the Lord. And, and God says, make a brass serpent, put it on a pole, and all who look upon it will be healed. Now, those who looked upon it were healed. But those who didn't weren't. I mean, it's just, you, it, of course, there's a, a symbol of the cross on this whole thing. But years go by, and this thing becomes an object of idolatry. It, this, it becomes a relic that becomes idolized. And Moses says, what is the word, Nehushtan, I think. It's a, a thing of brass. What are you doing? It's, you know, something that God used in a particular instance now becomes sort of an idol. When we, I think it's extremely wise to take an account of what God has done as he does it in your life. Keep a journal, keep a book, do it electronically, get a notebook, whatever you do. Keep record of what God does in your life when he does it. Because as hard as it is to, you know, we'll have to admit it, it's hard to believe, but we, we have to be honest about it. Even when God has done dramatic things in our lives, before long, they sort of fade into memory and they sort of, uh, if you remember the beginning of the Lord of the Rings, you know, this whole thing with, you know, this, the ring of power, it's, it, it, it becomes this, it's this game changer thing, but eventually it gets lost and, and, and what, how's it go? The, the stories become myth, the myth becomes legend and it sort of just disappears until one day, you know, but we'll stop there. But it's, but, you know, that's true of when God works in our lives. We set up these sort of stones of remembrance, but then they sort of become myth and the myth becomes legend. And it was back then when God did this some other time. Keep a record of it for yourself that you can remember. I'll tell you, when we moved here from Chicago, and I, I told a little of the story last, and I'm not going to go into it too much here right now, but just simply to say this. God gave me the presence of mind to record what he had done in our lives to get us to the point where we moved. And I, it was electronically, but I, I, I can pull up on my phone right now the electronic journal of what God did in that time. Scripture passages he gave us, events that took place, uh, I mentioned last time he moved someone from, from Nevada to come and fulfill roles that I had in the church that allowed me the freedom now to say, oh, they're covered. And then I could, I could then take the next step we could move. And so I kept a record of those things. And it's a good thing I did because the first two and a half to three years here were terrible, terrible, hard, difficult, painful, rough, faith stretching to the max. Difficult, difficult, hard, hard, difficult. <laughs> Awful. And I, I can't tell you how many times I went back to that journal and said, Lord, you know, those moments, is this really you? Did you really do this in our lives? Because this doesn't make any sense right now. Thankfully, we had a stone of remembrance. Look what God did. When you asked him, how did he answer? When you needed something to, 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 to continue to either illuminate the path or close the door, what did he do? And they were clear as day. Keep a record of what God does for you. Watch his, look back on, upon his faithfulness as a, as a reminder that he's not just faithful then. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is faithful then, he's faithful now. He'll be faithful tomorrow. It'll, it'll teach you not to allow your circumstances to guide you as far as God's faithfulness goes. He's not unfaithful in those first two and a half to three years that were terrible. He was faithful then too. And I'll, I'll move forward and I'll just end with this thought as to how I know God was faithful. As hard as that was, as difficult as it was, the lessons that were learned in that period of time were absolutely priceless. Master Carney got nothing on these experiences. This was, I remember sitting across the table from another pastor who happened at that time to be going through a season very similar. 
Uh, and no, no two people go through exactly the same thing. You know, it's, as much as we try to say, I know how you feel, that's, that seems like the most compassionate thing to say, but it's most often the most off the mark. No one really knows exactly how the other person's feeling. But we can relate to some degree, and then so we bring things to bear that are similar, that we hope will help. And in this particular case, uh, he was going through something that was very similar, and, and as he went through it, I said, you know, I don't know what God is exactly teaching you through this whole thing, but I will say this. The lessons that we learned in that time of hardship have allowed us to minister to people in a way that we never could have otherwise. There are some people that preach on these things like they read it from a book, and there are other people that preach it because they lived it. And what you're going through right now is going to give you the, the authority to speak to this in a way that you would not have before. And, and so remember, God is faithful, but that faithfulness may show itself in different ways. But write down the ways that he is. Do yourself this favor. Set up stones of remembrance, but just beware lest you let them become sort of a mausoleum for a dead faith that lives in the past. Now, so these 12 men took these 12 stones and they brought them out. They set them on the side so that uh, so they could be a, a, a marker, a visible reminder of God's faithfulness. But Joshua, as we just read uh, in verse 8, also does the same thing, but he sets up a pile of stones in the middle of the Jordan River bed. Now, we don't see where God told him to do this. I mean, God didn't correct him for doing it or anything like that. So maybe the Lord told him, or maybe he just in his own did it. I don't know. But he sets up a pile of 12 stones right where the, the priests were standing. Now, the priests had led the people across, but they stood in the middle of the Jordan River and allowed the people to cross before them until they were all across the other side. Then they followed and closed the train. So before they finished and before the priests left with the ark, Joshua gets these pile of 12 stones where the priests are standing and puts them down there as a reminder. How visible is that going to be when the waters come back? Not visible at all. What's the point of that? You know, the person who, you know, when Joshua records this, or some say maybe it was Ezra or Samuel may have recorded uh, some of these elements, whatever the case, uh, whoever it was that wrote that, when he says they're here to this day, they still existed at that time, you know, but what's the point of putting them in the riverbed? You can't see them when the, when the river comes back. I don't, I, don't, I don't know why Joshua felt the need to put them there, but I do admire that Joshua felt the need to do it. Some have kind of extrapolated from this, and extrapolate is not maybe too strong a word, but some have seen in this possibly the fact that Joshua knew that they wouldn't be seen, but by faith he remembered that God had done this, and that was his own reminder. I, we, I don't know. I don't know why he did it. But that he did it, I think, is, is really admirable. Joshua was not one of the 12 men that took the stones to the other side, even though he could have been the standard bearer for Ephraim, his, his own tribe. But 12 men did this. But Joshua, as their leader, felt it important to also set up a marker as well. Uh, the leader was not separate in his own activities from those he was leading. He uh, didn't lead by example because they did theirs first, but he, could, he connected himself with that same act. He gave his own mental assent to it, if you will, or he acted out on it as well. He was not separate from those that he had ultimately been leading, but he laid down his own, uh, his own uh, 12 stones as well, which I just find to be interesting and, and uh, uh, in the fact that he took no less part in establishing a memorial to God's might and faithfulness as well. Now, as we continue in verse 11, uh, or verse 10, I should say again, it, it speaks of how the Lord commended uh, 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 or I'm sorry, verse 11, it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over that the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed over in the presence of the people. And the men of Reuben, the men of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh crossed over armed before the children of Israel. And Moses had spoken, uh, as Moses had spoken to them, about 40,000 prepared for war crossed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. And on that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. So as they make their way across, uh, they get out of the Jordan Riverbed. The, the, the people are now across. The priests are making their way out of the Jordan Riverbed. Joshua's out. Um, and, and it mentions here about uh, Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh. Now, we spoke to this. It was either last week or the week before. Um, these two tribes and the half of the tribe of Manasseh wanted to set up their camp on the east side of the Jordan River. Uh, so if you're looking at the map, here's the promised land on the west side of the Jordan. When you hear, uh, uh, and then the east side over here is of the Jordan. The two and a half tribes want to set up camp here instead of crossing over and living here. 
Now, when they first floated that idea, uh, it didn't go over very well because it seemed like what they were going to do is convince the people not to cross over out of fear again. But they said, no, no, no. What we're going to do is we'll send our fighting men to help you when it comes time to conque uh, for conquest in the land. But when it's all said and done, we're going to set up camp on this side because it's, it looks like a great place to raise cattle uh, for us. And so we like this. And so it was, they consented to it, but you could tell it wasn't something they were really thrilled about. Uh, Moses and them. So anyway, so what they're doing here is fulfilling their end of the bargain. Uh, again, much could be said about the fact that they did not live in the promised land and they ended up being the first ones attacked when the enemy came. Uh, but, but just to continue on this morning, they, they do send 40,000 fighting men. Now there's about 130,000 men that could be fighting, that were of age, that could be fighting. So a, a much smaller number is actually fighting, about a third, one for every three men roughly. Um, so the other men, where are they? Well, they're protecting their wives, their children, the supplies, the stuff, and everything on the other side of the Jordan. They've sent 40,000 to fight with the armies of Israel, while the rest of the fighting men stay there to protect the land that they're in. So it's sort of, they're contributing, but probably not as much as they should have if they would have just been fully invested in crossing like they should have. But these 40,000 go ahead, uh, and they are there to fight with Israel when the time comes. And so these are the ones that have crossed over. Now again, verse 14, God exalts Joshua in the sight of all Israel as he had with Moses before him. So Joshua is being established. God is establishing him before the people. This is crucial. Moses was an extraordinary leader. He was, an, uh, he, was, he was not somebody who ever himself thought he would be a leader. He was not somebody that expected uh, God to use him like he did. But at the end of his days, God had used him dramatically. He cast a very long shadow. But now Joshua's time has come. And as we've started through verse chapter 1 and all that, we understand he was fearful of taking on the reins. But God is continuing to establish him before the people. He is becoming clearly their leader. And so... The people now have respect for, for Joshua, much like they did Moses. Now, verse 15, And then the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Command the priests who bear the ark of the testimony to come up from the Jordan. And Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come up from the Jordan, and it shall come to pass when the priests who bore the ark, or it came to pass when the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord had come from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet touched the dry land, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Quick ministry note here. The priests were the first one in and the last ones out. If you want to be in ministry, that's a good mantra. First one in, last one out. Isn't that like the Marines too? Or some, some arm of the military has that same thing. First one's in, last one's out, kind of last one's to leave. But that's, that's what ministry is. You know, you get there early, you set up, you, you last ones to lock the doors, you do whatever's needed, you know, we don't need Sunday school, we don't need sound, we, we need servants. That's, that's the idea. A servant is somebody who's there, and that's what these priests represented. They represented God to the people and the people to God, and this is what they considered, uh, this is what God had called them to. Once they left, then the waters uh, came back and overflowed the banks as it had before, and I personally would have liked to have seen that happen. Did it happen as soon as, the, as soon as their sole of their feet touched the thing? Now, the, the Jordan banks overflow. So it wasn't like just it came up to the bank and they were there out. I wonder if God just sort of had some fun with them and let the waters come. And they're like, whoa, hey, you know, just kind of dancing out of the waters. But it just, you know, it had to be an extraordinary thing to see. Just all of a sudden, here it comes. And the water comes right back down and the river continues uh, to flow. Just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So... Um, so now, as, as, uh, in verse 19, now the people came up uh, from the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those uh, 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. Uh, then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask your fathers in times to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall, say, you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over the Jordan on dry land, as we have spoken about. For the Lord your God dried up the waters from the Jordan before you until he had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. Now, it is interesting that... Uh, there were no stones of remembrance and that kind of thing around from the Red Sea crossing. Why? Because they were a faithless generation. But God was expecting more of this generation. 
You know, learn from the mistakes of those who've gone before. The, the, the call is always to walk by faith. Matter of fact, the only connection to the old generation was Joshua and Caleb, the only two that walked by faith from that generation. They're the only ones that continued on. So, uh, which uh, we had crossed over, verse 24, that all of the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Now, Gilgal. Gilgal figures prominently in Israel's history. We'll see here as we go through the book of Joshua that it forms a, uh, a sort of a base of operations. Uh, there's a constant coming back to Gilgal kind of a mindset here. And so it becomes sort of a base from which to launch various operations. It also is the place where Israel would anoint her first king. Uh, Saul ultimately is, becomes fully recognized as king in Gilgal. Uh, Samuel, in his own circuit in 1 Samuel, see he, Gilgal is part of that circuit. He never departs far from it. Uh, and also, um, as we'll see next time, it becomes the place of the nation's, uh, uh, I guess call it reconsecration to the Lord before they take on Jericho. It's where this generation now is circumcised uh, before they take on the nations. And so uh, Gilgal figures prominently. Uh, it is interesting that this is the place, uh, this place where the, the 12 stones of remembrance which as we went on for a while about this morning, the stones of remembrance are supposed to remind them of God's faithfulness, how he's there, how he's leading them, how he's mighty, how he's able to do all these things. It's the place where they actually, instead of letting God be their king anymore, becomes the place that they anoint a king in his place by the name of Saul. You remember when Saul was anointed king, it was not at God's command. The people wanted a king. They want someone to go in and out and fight their battles for them like the other nations. And Samuel was horrified at the request and it broke his heart. And God said to Samuel, they're not saying this against you, Samuel. They're saying it against me, you know? And so God gives them what they wanted. Saul, interestingly, is described as basically tall, dark, and handsome. Uh, he's taller than the rest. He's, uh, he's a good looking guy. His complexion's a little darker. And at the time he's anointed, he actually seems to start well. He's fearful of what he is being called upon to do. He doesn't have this arrogance that would crop up later, at least it's not visible yet. But the fact that Israel wanted a king was the problem. And it's here at Gilgal that is both the moment when they are given this wonderful memorial of God's faithfulness, but it's at that same place that they basically turn their backs on his faithfulness and put their trust in a human being instead. Interesting parallel, interesting contrast in these stories. Now, as we said before, as we kind of bring this to a close, it's important for us to remember and to memorialize in some way what God has done for our own benefit so we can remember. Uh, some of you take notes of these Bible studies. Why you'd memorialize those, I don't know. But you'd, 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 you'd want to remember what God has done as you write down or you record, or maybe you have a, uh, or maybe you picked up something uh, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, like this trip, for example. We'll probably bring home souvenirs that remind us of the mission trip and stuff. And, and to, to bring us back to that place where we were serving the Lord and saw things that he did, they'll remind us of these things. Those are healthy. But again, always beware lest they become an idol or they become a monument uh, to something that is past instead of a reminder of God's faithfulness today. Uh, I personally think, before I leave the subject and kind of close with, with, with my last thoughts on this, I personally think that one of the dangers of a church building is that it becomes an idol to a, to a body of believers. It can. It doesn't necessarily, but it can. How many of us growing up uh, remember hearing that if a tornado comes, the safest place to go is a church because God wouldn't destroy his house? That's baloney. There, there is no such truth. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, we're finding out that even people with matches can destroy God's house nowadays. You know, it's, it's a horrible thing. So don't put your faith in the structures in the building. It doesn't matter how pretty the stained glass is. Uh, it is significant that as God periodically has, uh, has, has, you know, well, actually, probably the best example I can think of. What, the first time God calls an altar to be built, he says that a, a, no, no tool should touch it. It should just be stones heaped up. No tool should touch it. By contrast, when Solomon builds an altar in the temple, it's this beautifully huge, ornate kind of a thing. 
and the temple becomes a thing of worship. What does Jesus himself say? You know, at the time when Herod has now sort of built upon the second temple, uh, you know, he, he accuses the Pharisees and scribes of, of, of talking about the temple, the temple, and all this kind of thing like, you know, as a matter of fact, when the temple was destroyed, uh, it, was, it was crushing. They couldn't believe it happened. Why? It's a structure. It's a building. It becomes the, the place that we have to be. Now, granted, there is a, an offering system that had to take place there. I get that. But it was the beauty of the temple and everything that was such a, an, a, an eye-catching thing. It was so impressive. And in our own days, sometimes the church building becomes sort of a, uh, a monument to, to our greatness and what we have accomplished. And look how big we've become in this kind of thing. No, you know... And this is not a rant for small churches. I'm just saying it's when a, when, a, when a building or a thing or an object becomes an idol, what once started as something that might have been a monument to the Lord and his goodness and greatness and faithfulness, when it ceases to be such, it by default becomes an idol. When it becomes the object of appreciation and worship, it by default has moved from what its intended purpose was, no matter how great that purpose might have been or how well-intentioned, it becomes an idol. And we have to be aware of that. Now, in fairness, being a small church can be an idol, too. I'm not poo-pooing the idea of being a building, uh, having a building. But the building is just a meeting place. The space that we meet is just that, no matter how ornate or beautiful it is. And so, this, uh, again, these stones of remembrance are simply, literally, just that, just stones of remembrance, objects that are, call, are supposed to remind us of what God has done. And God is not a stranger to the idea of having his people develop memorials of some kind or another. This is something that God encourages. The Exodus itself produced the Passover. The Passover is a memorial feast celebrated year after year after year, pointing to Christ. What does it point to? God's faithfulness in delivering from Egypt. Uh, uh, you know, you think about uh, even the reading of the law in Deuteronomy. God's, God tells the people that they're, and Moses continue, shares with the people how they're supposed to read the law uh, in, in every year of release. Every time that you're supposed to cancel the debts, that's the year you read the law as well. So that the law is constantly being reminded to the people. It's being rehearsed to them over and over and over again. There's uh, uh, it's, the passage escapes me right now, but the Ebenezer Stone. Yeah, we think of Ebenezer, when we hear the word Ebenezer, we typically think of Ebenezer Scrooge. But when we sing, uh, come thou fount of every blessing, here I, uh, here I lay my Ebenezer, and, and so on. The Ebenezer stone is a stone that speaks of God's faithfulness. Uh, it was called Ebenezer because it was supposed to symbolize that God has been faithful to us thus far. You know, it, it, was, it was supposed to build the confidence in the Lord. God is not opposed to memorializing his faithfulness as long as it, become, it remains a, rem a remembrance of that uh, the Last Supper which we'll celebrate in a few minutes it's a memorial to what Jesus has done it's not the it's not him dying over and over again it's a reminder of what he did for us his faithfulness that memory lives on as we take the bread and the cup now last thought verse 24 again these memorial, this memorial was set up so that not only would God's own people, but so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord, it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So two people groups were supposed to be impacted by this memorial. His own people, but also all the peoples of the earth, the other folks. And chapter 5, we find out in verse 1 that it worked because the people in Canaan were terrified over this group of people, the Israelites. And so God is making sure that there's a monument to the fact that he is great. He is great. And the nations will recognize it and be impacted by that. We'll pick that up next time in a couple of weeks uh, in chapter 5. So that said, we're going to move into a time of sharing in the Lord's Supper. And as we do, we want to prepare our hearts and remember his faithfulness to remember how God has saved us. He has sent his son to pay for our sins, to wash us clean, and to set us free from that which bound, bound us. We're free because of what he did, because of his greatness. Paul said that if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died for nothing. In other words, if we could somehow work up in ourselves an ability to save ourselves, then Jesus didn't have to come to the cross. Jesus himself said, Father, if there's any other way, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So that feat was so great and so far beyond us as to be beyond our capacity at all. But God, 
was faithful and God was mighty and God was strong enough to overcome sin in his son as he paid for our sins. And so we remember this today. So as we move into this time, let's give this to the Lord and ask him to help us to allow this stone of remembrance to ever remain before our eyes. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for your graciousness as you have taken our sin in Christ, you've, you've literally taken our sin upon your shoulders and you've paid for it. As we take the bread and the cup, we're reminded of your faithfulness, of your goodness, of your might, of your power, of your love, of your grace, and of your mercy. Thank you for these things. Nothing could be more personal to us than understanding that we, each and every one of us who are saved, are saved because of this. And so we thank you. And if there's anyone here that doesn't know the Lord personally, has never given their heart to Christ and surrendered, I want to give you that opportunity right now, especially now as we begin to move into partaking of the Lord's Supper. Jesus calls us to respond to his love. It's not enough that we know that Jesus went to the cross, but that we respond to it. So I want to give an invitation that you might right now. If you understand that you're a sinner and you're ready, if you understand that it's time to lay down your life, take up your cross and follow after him. It's time to leave the old man or the old woman behind and to walk in newness of life. And it's time. Understand that God is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you're ready to make that confession, I want to give you that opportunity now. Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I understand that I'm a sinner, that I've broken your law. I've offended you above all else. And that apart from Christ, I'm hopelessly lost in my sin and destined for an eternity apart from you in a place that was created for the devil and his angels. But I'm sorry for my sin. And I want to leave that life behind now so please forgive me. I thank you for your grace, your mercy. I thank you for loving me in spite of my sin and for saving me through your son who died on the cross and shed his blood for me that I might be forgiven and set free. Now help me to follow you all the days of my life, leaving the old man behind, taking up my cross each day, following after Jesus until I see you face to face. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to go ahead, and as we've made it our custom now, uh, to go ahead and, and uh, just begin to worship a little bit as we enter into this time. As we do, you're welcome to take a few moments. I invite you to take a few moments to bring your heart before the Lord. Confess any unconfessed sin. Make this moment something that is... Uh, we are open to the Lord completely. Let him see the deepest parts of your heart. Don't hide anything from him. Let this fellowship be real and unhindered. And then as you're ready, come on up and take the bread, the cup, bring it back to your seat and partake. And this will be about five or 10 minutes and then we'll go ahead and we'll close our service together.
Jesus, tears now.
We praise you, Father, and thank you so much that you showed your love to us and that while we were yet sinners, you sent your Son, Jesus, to die for us, the ungodly. And he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Thank you for this. Thank you for the freedom that we have. And thank you that you've called us to follow after you. You've not left us to find some trail to blaze all on our own, but you've promised to be with us and to be faithful to us. So thank you. We just pray that we'd glorify you, Lord, as we leave this place. A little later on, as we stick around to celebrate life, we pray that, Lord, as we continue to go on after that, that we would bring glory to you, the giver of life. So we praise you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand and sing the last verse of that song together? Sing in mansions of glory and endless delights. Mansions of glory and endless Enjoy the time with us as we celebrate Tara and Justin and their baby that's coming. Got some food here and stuff. We hope you can stick around for some fellowship. If not, have a wonderful week and please keep us in prayer this week as we leave on Tuesday morning early to go to Guatemala. We'll let you know how things go. Bless you all.